When the door opened and the police stepped in, Jack froze as he heard their first words. Mr. Tanner, your wife is at the hospital, and we need to talk to you immediately. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our podcast channel. Let's dive into the world of Jack Hill together. Jack Hill, 51, was a former Navy SEAL who later served 25 years as a police officer, retiring as a patrol sergeant. After retirement, Jack built a second career by turning his part-time home repair work into a successful contracting business. With his skills, reputation, and connections earned during his years on the force, Jack never needed to advertise. His name carried weight on its own, standing tall and solid. With the physique of a seasoned veteran, Jack exuded confidence and discipline paired with a deep dedication to his family. His wife, Laura, 46, was a vibrant and captivating woman. With her long, wavy blonde hair, sparkling green eyes, and radiant smile, Laura naturally drew attention wherever she went. Her lively personality made her well-liked by those around her. Laura worked as an executive assistant at Browning Global, a prestigious international company. She initially worked under George Browning, the company's founder, and continued in the role when his son, Charles Benson, took over. Respected and valued by her colleagues, Laura was seen as a reliable and trusted member of the team. Jack and Laura's family life was often described as idyllic. Married for 20 years, they shared a strong bond and raised their only son, Peter, who was 13 years old. Peter, with his youthful exuberance and passion for soccer, was the heart of the family. Jack and Laura shared responsibilities equally, from household chores to parenting. Jack often joked about staying far away from Laura's laundry room to avoid causing trouble, while Laura avoided outdoor yard work that she had little interest in. Family dinners were a cherished time for bonding, where Peter eagerly shared stories about school, friends, and his future plans. Occasionally, small disagreements arose, such as Peter's request for a TV in his room, which Jack firmly opposed. But the household was always filled with love and laughter. Jack and Laura also maintained a romantic spark in their marriage. To them, the bedroom was a sacred space, reserved for sleep and intimacy, free from distractions like TVs or gadgets. They maintained a consistent level of closeness that often drew admiration from their friends for how well they remained connected after so many years. However, beneath this seemingly perfect surface, small cracks were beginning to form. Laura's work with Charles Benson, her ambitious young boss, was slowly creating a sense of distance between her and Jack. Late work hours, business dinners, and compliments from Charles began to sow seeds of insecurity in Jack, though he never openly admitted it. To Jack, Laura was not just his wife, but his closest friend, someone he trusted implicitly. But on one fateful evening, when an unexpected guest appeared at their front door, the balance of their peaceful family life began to crumble. The night begins. The faint scent of lavender lingered in the air as Laura adjusted her earrings in front of the mirror her reflection aglow under the dim bedroom light. Her lips curled into a smile, soft but distant, the kind Jack hadn't seen in months. He leaned against the doorframe, arms crossed, observing her. Something gnawed at him, a quiet unease that had been building ever since she mentioned her colleague, Charlie. I'll be back by midnight, Laura said, brushing a strand of hair behind her ear. Jack cleared his throat. So, you're just gonna be dancing together? Her eyes darted toward him, the hesitation quick but unmistakable. Of course, she replied with practiced ease. It's just a celebration, Jack, nothing to worry about. The knot in his stomach tightened. He wanted to believe her, to shrug off the unease as paranoia. But something about her tone the casual way she avoided the details, unsettled him. And Charlie? What's he like? It's a colleague, Laura said, avoiding his gaze. We've worked together for years. It's nothing inappropriate. Jack didn't press further, but his mind raced with questions. Why had she never mentioned this Charlie before? And why was she so vague? 
careful not to reveal too much. The sound of a car pulling into the driveway broke the tense silence. Jack peered out the window and saw a sleek black sedan gleaming under the streetlights. When the driver stepped out, Jack's breath hitched. Charlie wasn't the woman he had pictured but a sharp-dressed younger man with a confident stride and a grin that set Jack's teeth on edge. Charlie's here, Laura said, grabbing her purse. Wait, Jack called, his voice harsher than intended. Laura froze mid-step, turning to face him. Jack stepped closer, his eyes dark with suspicion. Laura, this is a date. Let's not pretend otherwise. Her expression hardened. Jack, that's absurd. It's a professional outing. You're blowing this out of proportion. Am I? He shot back, his voice rising. Some suave guy shows up to take you out for drinks and dancing, and I'm just supposed to sit here and smile? I don't have time for this, Laura snapped, brushing past him. You're being ridiculous. Jack followed her to the top of the stairs, his anger bubbling over. Ridiculous? My wife wants to go out on a date with some young guy. No, Laura, I'm astonished. Laura spun around, her face flushed. I'm angry and hurt that you don't trust me. He's a colleague, that's all. Before Jack could respond, the doorbell rang. Laura glared at him, her eyes brimming with a mixture of defiance and hurt. I'm going, Jack. We'll talk about this later. The door clicked shut behind her, leaving Jack standing in the hallway, seething. He clenched his fists, torn between following her or letting her go. A part of him wanted to believe her, to trust that her intentions were innocent. But another part, darker and more cynical, whispered that he already knew the truth. Laura and Charlie arrived at a high-end venue, its opulent chandeliers casting golden light across the polished marble floors. The hum of conversation and clinking glasses filled the air as waiters in tailored suits glided between tables. Charlie pulled out a chair for Laura, his charm effortless. You look stunning tonight, he said, his voice smooth like honey. Laura blushed, a reaction that felt foreign to her. She wasn't used to such attention anymore. At home, Jack's compliments had grown rare, replaced by routine conversations and lingering silences. But here, under Charlie's gaze, she felt seen, desired even. As the evening unfolded, Charlie's words wove a tapestry of flattery, each compliment a thread that tightened around her self-restraint. The first glass of wine eased her tension. The second warmed her cheeks. By the third, prepared by Charlie himself, her inhibitions began to slip away. You deserve to be celebrated, Charlie said, his hand brushing hers. Women like you are rare, strong, beautiful, and intelligent. Jack is a lucky man. Laura smiled weakly, her vision blurring slightly. A strange heaviness settled over her, as though the room had grown warmer, the lights brighter. Thank you, she murmured, her voice barely audible. The music shifted, a slow, sultry tune filling the room. Charlie stood and extended a hand. Dance with me. Her instincts screamed to decline, to set boundaries, but the fog in her mind dulled her judgment. She let him lead her to the dance floor, his hand firm against the small of her back. The room seemed to spin as they swayed, Charlie's presence overwhelming. When he leaned closer, whispering something she couldn't quite make out, she tried to pull away, but her limbs felt heavy, unresponsive. Finally, ah, eh, the last thing Laura remembered was being guided to a dimly lit hallway, her protests slurred and incoherent. Darkness closed in, suffocating and absolute. Back at home, Jack sat on the couch, staring at the clock. Midnight came and went, and with every passing minute, and with every passing minute, his anger deepened. Images of Laura laughing with Charlie, her hand on his arm played in his mind like a tormenting reel. 
He paced the living room, his thoughts spiraling. Was she dancing with him now? Sharing secrets? Kissing him? The thought made his chest tighten, a mix of jealousy and betrayal clawing at him. By 2 a.m., Jack's anger boiled over. He grabbed his keys, ready to drive to the venue and confront them, but he stopped himself. What would he say? What proof did he have? He sank back onto the couch, his head in his hands, overwhelmed by a storm of emotions. When the door finally opened just before dawn, it wasn't Laura who stepped in, but a police officer. Mr. Tanner? The officer asked, his expression grim. Jack's heart dropped. What's going on? Is Laura okay? Ah, she's at the hospital, the officer said. She's been assaulted. The words hit Jack like a physical blow, the room spinning around him. He grabbed his coat, his mind racing. Anger, guilt, and fear collided as he followed the officer out the door, each step heavier than the last. The stage was set for a reckoning, the threads of Jack and Laura's lives unraveling with every passing moment. As Jack walked into the hospital, the weight of what lay ahead pressed down on him, a storm of emotions brewing just beneath the surface. The conflict that began with suspicion would soon spiral into something far darker, threatening to consume them both. The city glimmered with an eerie vibrance that evening, the lights of the high-end venue reflecting on rain-slicked streets. Inside, the hum of laughter, clinking glasses, and low music wrapped around Laura like a velvet cocoon. Her pulse quickened, not from excitement, but a strange mix of unease and exhilaration she couldn't quite place. She had told herself this was innocent, professional, but something about Charlie's lingering gaze and the way his smile lingered just a second too long set her on edge. When she stepped into the venue, Charles at her side, she felt the weight of the decision pressing against her like the tightening straps of a corset. The subtle scent of his cologne filled the air, crisp and commanding, and his hand hovered near the small of her back, not quite touching, but present. It was enough to remind her of Jack's voice, heavy with doubt, accusing, lingering in the back of her mind like a ghost she couldn't shake. Relax, Laura, Charles said his voice a smooth murmur. You're here to enjoy yourself. Tonight's about celebrating. Celebrating what? Ugh! The question rattled in her brain, but she smiled instead, the same polite mask she wore during office meetings. It's just been a long day. Charles laughed softly, the sound a mix of charm and something darker. <laughs> That's why we're here. A drink will fix that right up. They found a table near the center of the room, its candlelight flickering like a nervous heartbeat. Charles ordered for both of them without asking, wine for her, something stronger for himself. Laura hesitated as the waiter set the glasses down, the deep red liquid swirling like blood in the dim light. Drink up, Charles urged, lifting his own glass. To new beginnings. Laura raised her glass, her movement stiff. To your promotion. The wine was smoother than she expected, warm as it slid down her throat, easing some of the tension coiling in her chest. For a moment, she allowed herself to relax, letting the conversation flow into safer territory. Work, mutual colleagues, the mundane office politics she knew so well, but Charles kept steering it back to her. You're the backbone of the team, you know, he said, his voice low, intimate. It's obvious you're underappreciated there. Laura's cheeks flushed. Was that true? Jack's criticisms had stung lately. About her work hours, her lack of presence at home but here was someone who noticed her efforts, admired her. She felt a flicker of pride and guilt, tangled together in a knot she couldn't untie. Meanwhile, back at home, Jack sat hunched over the kitchen table, 
the sharp tick of the clock amplifying the emptiness of the house. He had poured himself a glass of whiskey, its amber liquid untouched, as he stared into the dark. The quiet was oppressive, his thoughts filling the void with images he didn't want to see. Laura laughing, leaning in too close, her hand grazing Charlie's. He wanted to believe her. He truly did. But the way she had defended Charlie, the flash of something unreadable in her eyes when he confronted her, it was all too convenient, too perfectly rehearsed. His mind played cruel tricks, filling the silence with imagined whispers of betrayal. You're being paranoid, he muttered to himself, his voice hollow. But even as he said it, the shadows in the room seemed to mock him, stretching long and jagged, feeding his doubt. At the restaurant, the second glass of wine had dulled Laura's apprehension. The music shifted to a slower melody, the kind that invited couples to the dance floor. Charles extended his hand, his smile disarming. May I have this dance? Laura hesitated, but the weight of his gaze left no room for refusal. Just one, she said, her voice softer than she intended. The dance floor was bathed in dim golden light, and as Charles led her into a slow rhythm, Laura felt the wine's warmth deepen, spreading through her limbs. She focused on the movement, the sway of the music, anything but the intensity of his eyes on her. You don't let yourself have fun often, do you? he asked, his tone teasing, yet laced with something more. I have responsibilities, she replied, though the words felt defensive even to her own ears. You're allowed to let go, Laura, he said, his hand lingering a moment too long at her waist. You deserve more than just responsibility. The words sank into her, bitter and sweet at once. She thought of Jack, how his warmth had been replaced by suspicion, his laughter by sharp words. She shook the thought away, but it clung to her like cobwebs. As the night wore on, Charles's charm took on a sharper edge. Something she didn't recognize. It's sweet, the text giving the style, excaving the taste, given the speak of lofty efficacy of deception. Laura tried to focus, but her thoughts felt slippery, as though her mind were a carousel spinning too fast. I... I think I need some air, she murmured, her words slurring slightly. Charles was at her side instantly, his arm steadying her. Of course, let me help you. If you have ever experienced a similar situation, please share your story in the comments section. Jack's phone buzzed on the counter, jolting him from his thoughts. It was late, too late for her to still be out. He stared at the screen, willing it to light up with a message from Laura, some reassurance that she was okay. But the silence stretched, taut and unyielding, until it was broken by his own voice. <sighs> Where are you? He whispered into the empty room, the question hanging in the air like a weight. He thought about calling her, but pride held him back. If she was doing what he feared, he didn't want to confirm it, not yet. The whiskey burned his throat as he finally drank, his anger simmering into something darker, something closer to despair. Laura barely registered the shift as Charles guided her down a quiet hallway. The sounds of the restaurant faded, replaced by the distant hum of an elevator. Her body felt heavy, unresponsive, and her protests came out as murmurs, weak and incoherent. 
Relax, Charles whispered, his tone losing its polish. You'll feel better soon. The walls seemed to close in, the dim light casting twisted shadows that danced like spectres. Laura tried to push him away, but her arms felt like lead, her thoughts unravelling into a haze of fear and confusion. The last thing she remembered was the cold press of the elevator button against her back, her vision darkening as Charles's voice became a distant echo. At home, Jack paced the room, his phone clenched in his hand. His gut screamed that something was wrong, that this night was the beginning of something he wouldn't be able to undo. And yet, he felt powerless, trapped in a storm of his own making, the weight of his suspicions crushing him. The city outside gleamed like a predator's eye, watching, waiting. Jack stared out the window, the dark sky reflecting his own turmoil. Somewhere out there, Laura was slipping further away, and he wasn't sure if he would be able to pull her back, or if he even wanted to. The stage was set, the players all in place, but the script was one Jack feared he wouldn't survive. The clock's monotonous ticking filled the void in the room, each second hammering into Jack's mind like an accusation. The whiskey bottle, now half empty, sat beside him on the coffee table, its amber hue reflecting the dim glow of the kitchen light. Outside, the city had fallen into its familiar rhythm of late-night quiet, but Jack's world was anything but still. His thoughts churned, sharp and relentless, carving deeper into his insecurities. The images wouldn't stop, Laura's laughter ringing in his ears, her hand brushing against Charlie's arm. The way she had defended him earlier, her words laced with frustration, almost as if he was the one in the wrong for questioning her. The silence now was deafening, amplifying his fears. <laughs> she said it was nothing, he muttered to himself, his voice raw, but the words felt hollow, like a brittle shell cracking under the weight of his doubt. His phone buzzed, jolting him upright. For a brief, desperate moment, Hope surged. Maybe it was Laura, telling him she was on her way home, that everything was fine. But when he glanced at the screen, it was only a spam notification. The disappointment settled like a stone in his chest. Jack slammed the phone down, the sharp sound echoing in the emptiness. What the hell are you doing, Laura? He whispered into the quiet. But the house, with its familiar corners and shadows, offered no answers only the unyielding reflection of his own turmoil. Elsewhere, Laura's world was unravelling. She woke to a jarring stillness, her head pounding as if her thoughts were trapped in a foggy, chaotic loop. The room was unfamiliar. Sterile white walls, a faint antiseptic smell, and the dim hum of fluorescent lights. Panic set in, sharp and immediate, cutting through the haze like a knife. Her mind clawed for clarity, replaying fragmented images from the night before. The wine. The music. Charlie's hand guiding her somewhere. Her pulse raced as the realisation crashed over her like a tidal wave. This isn't right. This isn't where I'm supposed to be. She tried to sit up, but her limbs felt heavy, her body unresponsive. A deep, primal fear coiled in her chest as she scanned the room. Her dress was crumpled, her shoes gone, and her skin crawled with the unmistakable feeling that she'd been violated. Tears welled in her eyes as her breath quickened, the suffocating weight of shame pressing down on her. For a moment she couldn't think, couldn't move, but then a single thought anchored her. I need to get out of here. She stumbled to her feet, clutching the edge of the bed for support. Every step felt like a battle as she made her way to the door, her heart pounding in her ears. The hallway outside was empty, its silence unnerving. Her mind screamed at her to run, but her body moved sluggishly, weighed down by both physical exhaustion and emotional shock. Back at home, 
Jack sat in the dim light, his anger cooling into something colder, an unbearable mix of guilt and helplessness. The whiskey had dulled his edge, but it hadn't silenced the questions gnawing at him. What if he had been too harsh? What if Laura was telling the truth and he had pushed her away with his accusations? But just as quickly another thought surfaced, darker and more insidious. What if I'm right? The conflict tore at him, the threads of their marriage unravelling in his mind. He thought of their early years together, how Laura's laugh had once been enough to light up his entire world. When had that changed? When had suspicion replaced trust? Jack's phone buzzed again, breaking his reverie. This time, it was a number he didn't recognise. He hesitated before answering, his voice heavy with unease. Mr. Tanner? A woman's voice asked, professional and calm. Yes, this is Jack, he replied, sitting up straighter. His heart began to race, sensing something was wrong. This is Officer Daniels. Your wife, Laura, has been admitted to St. Mary's Hospital. She asked for you. The words hit him like a freight train. Hospital? What happened? Is she okay? The officer's tone softened, but the gravity of her words remained. She's been through an ordeal. It would be best if you came in person. Jack didn't need to hear more. He grabbed his keys, his heart pounding as he bolted out the door. The drive to the hospital was a blur, the city's lights flashing by like jagged memories. His mind raced with questions, each one more terrifying than the last. When he arrived at the hospital, the sterile brightness of the lobby felt jarring, almost accusatory. A nurse led him to a small room where Laura sat on the edge of the bed, her face pale and tear-streaked. Her hands trembled as she clutched the blanket around her shoulders. Laura! Jack breathed, his voice breaking as he rushed to her side. She looked up at him, her eyes filled with a mixture of relief and devastation. Jack, she whispered, her voice cracking. He reached for her hand, but she flinched, pulling away. The movement was subtle, but it hit Jack like a punch to the gut. What happened? He asked, his voice trembling. Tell me. Her words came slowly, haltingly, as she recounted the nightmare. She told him about the drinks, the dizziness, and waking up in the unfamiliar room. Her voice wavered as she described the realization of what had been done to her, each word laced with pain and humiliation. Jack listened, his hands clenched into fists at his sides. Anger surged through him, hot and blinding, but beneath it was something even more overwhelming. Guilt. He had doubted her, accused her, and while he had been wallowing in his own insecurities, she had been fighting a nightmare alone. D did he hurt you? Jack asked, his voice barely above a whisper. Laura nodded, tears streaming down her face. I didn't have a choice, she said, her voice cracking. He drugged me, Jack. I couldn't, I couldn't stop him. The room fell silent, the weight of her words suffocating. Jack felt like the air had been knocked out of him. He wanted to comfort her, to hold her and tell her it wasn't her fault. But the anger inside him burned too brightly, consuming his thoughts. We'll go to the police, he said finally, his voice firm. He won't get away with this. Laura's eyes widened with fear. Jack, I can't, I can't go through that. The questions, the humiliation, everyone will know. They'll know he did this, Laura, Jack said his voice rising. You're the victim. This isn't your shame to carry. But she shook her head, her sobs growing louder. You don't understand. It doesn't matter what's true. People will blame me. They'll say I asked for it. Jack's fists tightened, his nails digging into his palms. He wanted to argue, to convince her that the world wasn't as cruel as she feared. But deep down, he knew she was right. The system was stacked against her, and the fight for justice would come at a cost neither of them were prepared to pay. 
He sat beside her, his head in his hands, as the weight of their reality settled over them like a suffocating fog. Their marriage, already fragile, now seemed irreparably shattered. And yet, as they sat in the sterile hospital room, Jack realized they were bound together by this shared pain, a pain that would either destroy them or force them to rebuild from the ashes. The fluorescent lights of the hospital hallway seemed colder than Jack could bear, casting pale reflections on the linoleum floor that stretched endlessly in either direction. Every step toward Laura's room felt like wading through molasses, his heart a leaden weight in his chest. He barely noticed the hum of the nurse's station, the muffled cries from a nearby patient, or the soft squeak of a janitor's mop. His focus was singular, Laura. When he finally reached her door, the sight of her sent a fresh wave of anguish crashing over him. Laura sat upright in the hospital bed, her face pale, eyes rimmed red. Her hands trembled as they clutched the thin hospital blanket, pulling it tightly around her shoulders like armor. A bandage adorned her arm where the IV was inserted, and her lips were chapped, parted as if she wanted to speak but couldn't summon the strength. Laura, Jack breathed, stepping inside. Puh. Her head turned toward him, her expression flickering between relief and something he couldn't quite name. Fear, maybe. Or shame. You came, she whispered, her voice barely audible over the rhythmic beeping of the machines. Jack pulled a chair beside her bed, lowering himself into it like a man burdened by decades of sorrow. He tried to reach for her hand, but she withdrew slightly, her movement instinctive. That tiny motion, a fraction of an inch, gutted him. He let his hand fall to his lap, staring at the floor as the silence between them stretched taut. I I'm sorry, he said finally, his voice hoarse. I should have been there, I should have stopped this. Laura shook her head weakly. It's not your fault, Jack. But it is, he replied, his tone sharpening. I let you leave. I didn't stop you, even though I knew... Miko held up a hand. He broke off, swallowing hard. I knew something wasn't right. Her gaze softened, but the tears welling in her eyes told another story. You couldn't have known, she said, though the words rang hollow. Her voice cracked as she continued. I couldn't have known. The nurse entered then, breaking the fragile moment. She carried a clipboard and offered a practice smile, the kind meant to soothe, but which only emphasized the rawness of their pain. Mrs. Tanner, she said gently, the doctor wants to discuss your blood work and the next steps. Laura nodded, though the motion seemed to drain her. Jack rose instinctively, his body taut with tension. What blood work? he asked, his voice sharp. What's wrong? The nurse hesitated, glancing at Laura for permission. She gave a faint nod, and the nurse continued. Um, we tested for traces of any substances. The results confirm she was drugged. Rohypnol and ketamine were found in her system. The words sliced through Jack like a blade, and for a moment, he couldn't breathe. His vision swam as rage surged in his veins, hot and unrelenting. Drugged, he repeated, his voice low and dangerous. That bastard? Jack, Laura interrupted, her voice trembling but firm. Please, don't. He turned to her, his jaw clenched so tightly it ached. Don't what? Don't be angry? Don't want to rip that bastard apart for what he did to you? Her eyes filled with fresh tears, and she looked away. Being angry won't change what happened. The nurse excused herself quietly, leaving them alone again in the suffocating silence. Jack leaned forward, resting his elbows on his knees, his hands gripping his hair as if he could pull himself back from the edge of his rage. The detectives arrived an hour later, their presence heavy with authority and procedure. Detective Ramirez, a middle-aged woman with kind but tired eyes, sat across from Laura, her voice calm and measured. 
We know this is difficult, Ramirez began, her notebook resting on her knee. But we need to establish a timeline. Can you walk us through the evening? Laura hesitated, her hands twisting the blanket in her lap. Jack sat beside her, his entire body coiled like a spring, ready to lash out at the slightest provocation. I, I had three drinks, Laura said, her voice barely above a whisper. The last one, he brought it to me. After that, everything gets blurry. Charles, Jack spat, his anger boiling over. His name is Charles, and he's the one who did this to her. Detective Ramirez held up a hand, her expression placating. We'll get to him, Mr. Tanner. Right now, we're focusing on Laura's account. Jack bit back his retort, though his fists remained clenched. He felt like a volcano ready to erupt, the lava of his fury threatening to consume him. Laura's voice shook as she continued, recounting the fragmented memories that haunted her. The dance floor, the hallway, the unfamiliar room. When she described waking up and realizing what had happened, her voice broke and tears spilled down her cheeks. Detective Ramirez leaned forward slightly, her tone softer. I know this is painful, but these details will help us build a case. Do you feel strong enough to identify him? Um, Laura hesitated, her breath hitching. I, I, I don't know. Jack exploded. What do you mean you don't know? He's the one who did this to you, Laura. You can't let him walk away. She flinched at his words, her tears falling faster. I'm scared, Jack, she cried. Do you think this is easy for me? Do you think I want him to get away with it? But <laughs> if I press charges, they'll ask questions, questions I can't answer without reliving everything. Jack opened his mouth to argue, but closed it again when he saw the anguish in her eyes. He had never felt so powerless, so utterly incapable of protecting the woman he loved. Later that night, as the detectives left and the hospital quieted, Jack sat alone in the corner of Laura's room, staring out the window. The city lights seemed distant, blurred by the rain streaking the glass. Laura had fallen into a restless sleep, her body curled into itself, as if trying to disappear. Jack's mind raced, replaying the events of the past 24 hours. The guilt was suffocating, wrapping around him like chains. He had failed her, failed to protect her, failed to trust her. The man she should have been able to rely on had been too consumed by his own insecurities to see the danger right in front of them. He glanced at her, her fragile form illuminated by the pale hospital light. She looked so small, so vulnerable, and yet he knew she was stronger than he could ever be. She had survived something unimaginable, and here she was, breathing, fighting, even if she didn't realize it. Jack leaned forward, resting his head in his hands. He didn't know how they would recover from this, how their marriage could withstand the weight of everything that had happened. But one thing was certain, he would find Charles. And when he did, there wouldn't be a place on earth where that man could hide. For now, though, all he could do was sit by Laura's side, guarding her as she slept, the promise of vengeance burning quietly in his heart. The days following Laura's assault passed like the aftermath of a storm. The chaos of police reports and hospital visits had subsided, but what remained between Jack and Laura felt like the wreckage of their marriage. Shattered pieces they no longer knew how to fit together. Their once familiar home with its warm corners and shared memories had become a cold, silent battlefield. Jack sat at the edge of the bed one evening, staring at the faint outline of his reflection in the darkened window. The house was quiet except for the muffled hum of the heater. The air between him and Laura had grown heavy, like, like fog settling over a desolate landscape. She lay on her side of the bed, her back to him, the physical distance mirroring the emotional chasm that had formed between them. He wanted to reach out, to bridge the gap, but his hand froze midair, weighed down by a flood of doubts. What could he say? 
that hadn't already been said, that he was sorry, that he had failed her. He'd tried those words before, but they felt like stones tossed into a bottomless well, swallowed without echo. Laura's voice broke the silence, brittle and weary. Are you going to keep sitting there? Or are you going to tell me what's on your mind? Jack flinched, her words sharp as broken glass. I'm just trying to figure out how to fix this, he admitted, his voice barely above a whisper. She turned to face him, her expression unreadable in the dim light. Fix what, Jack? Me? Us? She let out a hollow laugh, devoid of warmth. You, you can't fix what's already broken. The words hit Jack like a punch to the gut. So, that's it? We just give up? Laura's gaze softened for a moment, but her eyes glistened with unshed tears. I don't know, Jack. I don't know how to come back from this. Every time I look at you, I see the way you doubted me. And every time you look at me, I feel like all you see is what happened that night. Jack shook his head, frustration bubbling to the surface. That's not true, Laura. I see you. I see the woman I fell in love with. The woman I wanted to build a life with. Her lips trembled, but she stood firm. Maybe that's who we were, Jack but it's not who we are anymore. The counseling sessions they'd reluctantly agreed to felt like trying to plant seeds in barren soil. The therapist, a kind woman with a gentle voice, tried to guide them through their pain, but the words fell flat, their wounds too fresh, too deep. During one session, Laura finally voiced the question that had been gnawing at her. Do you resent me for what happened? Jack's head snapped up, his eyes wide with disbelief. Resent you? Laura, I'm furious at him. I'm furious at the world for what happened to you. But you? Never. Then why does it feel like you're punishing me? She asked, her voice cracking. Why does it feel like every time you look at me, you're searching for answers I can't give you? Jack opened his mouth to respond, but closed it again, his throat tightening. He didn't know how to explain the storm of emotions inside him. The anger, the guilt, the helplessness. Because I don't know how to let this go, he admitted finally, his voice raw. I don't know how to stop feeling like I failed you. The therapist interjected gently. Sometimes, in trying to protect each other from pain, we end up building walls instead. And walls can be hard to tear down. But Jack and Laura weren't building walls. They were retreating into fortresses, their grief and guilt the bricks that kept them apart. At night, Jack found himself haunted by memories of simpler times. He thought of their first apartment, the cramped space filled with laughter and late-night conversations. He thought of the way Laura's eyes used to light up when she talked about her dreams how they'd shared plans for a future that now seemed like a cruel joke. And yet, those memories felt like they belonged to someone else. A couple, untouched by betrayal, by tragedy. The Laura lying beside him now was a stranger, and Jack wondered if she felt the same about him. Laura, too, was grappling with her own maze of emotions. She wanted to forgive Jack for his doubts, to find solace in the man who had once been her rock. But every time she tried, her mind replayed the moments when he had hesitated, when his eyes had filled with suspicion instead of love. She knew he was hurting, but her own pain was too consuming. She felt like a vase cracked in too many places, holding together on the surface, but with fractures too deep to repair. One evening, Laura found herself standing in the doorway of the nursery, staring at the faded mural on the wall. It had been Peter's room once, back when they'd believed a baby could fix everything. But Peter was older now, spending most of his time at school or with friends, and the nursery had become a storage space for things they no longer needed. Jack appeared behind her, his voice hesitant. I was thinking we could repaint it, make it into something Peter can use. 
Laura didn't turn around. Maybe, she said softly, her voice devoid of conviction. Jack stepped closer, his presence tentative. Laura, I don't want to lose you. Her shoulders slumped and she finally faced him, her eyes filled with a quiet resignation. Jack, I think we already lost each other. The decision to separate came with more silence than shouting. It was a mutual acknowledgement of what they both knew to be true. Their love, the once fierce and bright, had been eroded by too many storms. Sitting across from each other at the dining table, Jack signed the papers with a heavy hand, the weight of finality pressing down on him. Laura signed next, her fingers trembling but steady enough to finish. They exchanged no words. There was nothing left to say. Months later, Jack sat in a coffee shop, his hands wrapped around a mug of black coffee. Across from him sat Natalie, a woman whose gentle smile carried its own scars. She was different from Laura, quieter, softer, but her resilience shone in a way that drew Jack in. Do you ever regret it? Natalie asked softly, her question laced with curiosity, not judgment. Jack thought for a long moment, his gaze distant. I regret how it ended, he said finally, but I don't regret trying. As for Laura, she found herself walking through a park on a crisp autumn morning, the leaves crunching beneath her feet. Beside her was Daniel, a widower who had weathered his own share of loss. He held her hand lightly, as if understanding she needed room to breathe. I didn't think I'd ever feel this again, Laura admitted, her voice barely above a whisper. Daniel smiled gently. Sometimes the hardest part isn't finding love again. It's letting yourself believe you deserve it. In the end, Jack and Laura weren't a story of happily ever after, but a story of survival. They had loved fiercely, lost painfully, and emerged on the other side as different people. Their paths no longer intertwined, but the echoes of their shared past lingered, a reminder that even broken things could teach us how to be whole again. The night Jack first set eyes on Charles after the hospital incident was etched into his memory like a dark scar. It had been weeks since Laura's assault, weeks spent simmering in a cauldron of rage, helplessness, and guilt. The justice system, he quickly realized, was a labyrinth of delays and uncertainty, a slow-moving machine that seemed ill-equipped to deliver the vengeance burning in his chest. Charles had gone back to his life, untouched and unrepentant, as if nothing had happened. Jack, on the other hand, couldn't move on. His thoughts circled back to Laura's broken expression in the hospital room, her trembling voice as she recounted the nightmare. Each detail was a dagger in his heart, sharpening his anger into something colder, more calculating. If the system wouldn't make Charles pay, Jack would. One evening, Jack sat alone in the dim light of his living room, a tumbler of whiskey untouched in his hand. The shadows on the walls seemed to mock him, flickering like phantoms of doubt. He couldn't escape the inner turmoil, a relentless storm of questions and justifications. Am I really going to do this? He whispered into the silence. But the answer had been clear from the start. This wasn't just about revenge. It was about reclaiming the power Charles had stolen from Laura, the dignity stripped away when he drugged and assaulted her. Jack's sense of morality, once steady as a compass, now wavered under the weight of his fury. His need for justice or vengeance consumed him like a wildfire, leaving no room for hesitation. Jack's first move was to reach out to Frank, an old friend from his past life. Frank was the kind of man Jack had avoided since marrying Laura, gritty, pragmatic, and with a moral compass as crooked as a warped ruler. But Jack knew that if anyone could help him track Charles, it was Frank. Frank didn't ask questions when Jack called. He showed up at Jack's house the next day, his broad frame filling the doorway, his sharp eyes scanning Jack with a mix of curiosity and concern. Didn't think I'd hear from you again, Frank said, his voice low and gravelly. What's this about? 
Jack hesitated, the words catching in his throat. Finally, he said, I need to find someone, and I need to make sure he doesn't hurt anyone, ever again. Frank raised an eyebrow but nodded. I'll see what I can do. It didn't take long. Within a week, Frank handed Jack a folder, its contents meticulous and damning. Charles's address, his habits, his haunts. Jack's pulse quickened as he flipped through the pages, each detail fueling the fire inside him. The night Jack confronted Charles was colder than he expected, the air biting against his skin as he waited outside the upscale bar where Charles often spent his evenings. The street lights cast long, distorted shadows, and the city's hum seemed quieter, as if holding its breath for what was to come. Jack spotted Charles emerging from the bar, his expensive suit tailored to perfection, his smug smile plastered across his face. He was chatting with a friend, his laughter cutting through the night like a blade. Jack clenched his fists, the image of Lara's tear-streaked face flashing in his mind. As Charles turned down a quieter street, Jack followed, his footsteps deliberate and heavy. When they were alone, Jack called out, his voice cold and steady. Charles. Charles turned, his expression shifting from confusion to recognition. Jack Tanner, he said, his tone dripping with mockery. What brings you here? Still playing the angry husband? Jack closed the distance between them in a heartbeat, grabbing Charles by the collar and slamming him against the brick wall of the alley. Charles's smug grin faltered, replaced by a flicker of fear. You think you can just walk away from what you did? Jack hissed, his voice low and venomous. You think you can keep living your life while she suffers? Charles chuckled, though the sound was strained. I don't know what you're talking about. You've got no proof. Nothing will stick. Jack's grip tightened, his knuckles whitening. This isn't about proof. This is about justice. Before Charles could respond, a shadow moved behind them. Frank stepped into the alley, his presence looming like a specter. He held a metal briefcase in one hand, his expression devoid of emotion. Jack, Frank said calmly, are you sure about this? Jack hesitated, his breath hitching. The conflict within him was palpable, a war between the part of him that wanted to be better than this and the part that needed Charles to suffer. Finally, he nodded. Do it. Frank opened the briefcase, revealing a set of surgical tools gleaming under the faint light. Charles's eyes widened in terror and he began to struggle, but Jack held him firmly. You can't do this, Charles cried, his voice cracking. You'll go to prison. Jack leaned in close, his voice a whisper. Prison would be a mercy compared to what you deserve. When it was over, Jack couldn't bring himself to look at what Frank had done. The briefcase was closed, its contents hidden, but the blood on Frank's gloves was enough to make Jack's stomach churn. He hadn't expected it to feel this way, so hollow, so final. Frank handed him a small jar, its contents unrecognizable but unmistakably gruesome. Your call if you want to keep it, Frank said, his tone matter-of-fact. Jack stared at the jar, his emotions a tangled mess. He didn't feel the satisfaction he'd expected, only a deep, gnawing emptiness. Get rid of it, he said finally, his voice barely audible. Frank nodded, leaving Jack alone in the alley. Charles lay unconscious against the wall, his face pale and his suit ruined. Jack stared at him for a long moment, the weight of his actions settling over him like a suffocating blanket. When Jack returned home that night, the house was eerily quiet. He sat on the edge of his bed, his hands trembling as he replayed the night's events in his mind. He had wanted justice, but now he wasn't sure if he had crossed a line he couldn't come back from. The shadows in the room seemed to shift, taking on the forms of his doubts and fears. Laura's face came to him again, not in anger or pain, but in quiet disappointment. He had avenged her, but at what cost? Had he become the very thing he despised? Jack buried his face in his hands, 
his breath shaky. The man he had been, the man Laura had fallen in love with, was gone. In his place was someone he barely recognized, a man consumed by vengeance and regret. And though Charles would never hurt another woman again, Jack couldn't shake the feeling that his victory was nothing more than ashes in his hands. The autumn air was crisp, carrying with it the scent of fading leaves and the promise of change. Jack sat on a park bench, his fingers wrapped around a steaming cup of coffee. The world moved around him, joggers on the path, children chasing each other on the playground, a couple walking hand in hand. Life continued, indifferent to the wreckage he carried in his chest. It had been a year since that night in the alley, a year since Charles was reduced to whispers in the corporate world, his reputation irrevocably tarnished. No formal charges were ever filed, neither by Laura nor by the other women who had come forward. The streets had a way of delivering their own kind of justice, Jack had learned, one that left no paper trail but plenty of scars. Jack tilted his head back, watching the way the late afternoon sun pierced through the branches, casting dappled shadows on the ground. The light flickered, shifting, as though mimicking the rhythm of his thoughts. He wasn't proud of what he'd done, but he wasn't sure he regretted it either. What haunted him most wasn't the act itself, but the person it had revealed him to be, a man who could go to such lengths for revenge and still find no peace. Laura sat at her kitchen table, her hands cradling a warm mug of tea. The house was quiet now. Peter was spending the weekend with Jack. She'd insisted on joint custody when they finalized the divorce. Despite everything, Jack had been a good father, and she didn't want her son to lose that. The divorce had been amicable as far as those things could be. There were no screaming matches, no dragged-out court battles. Just a quiet acknowledgement that their marriage had become something neither of them could fix. They signed the papers in a sterile office, exchanged polite goodbyes, and walked out of each other's lives as partners, but not as enemies. Still, there were nights when Laura would sit in the silence and wonder what could have been. She loved Jack once, deeply and completely. A part of her always would. But love, she had learned, wasn't always enough. Trust, once broken, was like glass. It could be pieced back together, but the cracks would always remain. Jack saw Laura from a distance before she saw him. She was at the edge of the playground, smiling faintly as Peter climbed the jungle gym. Her hair was shorter now, and she carried herself differently, lighter, as though she had shed a weight that had been dragging her down. Jack felt a pang of something bittersweet. She looked happier. Hey, he called, walking over. Laura turned, her smile warming when she saw him. Hey, Jack. They stood there for a moment, the air between them filled with unspoken words. It wasn't awkward exactly, but it wasn't easy either. There was too much history, too much pain to pretend otherwise. Peter wanted an extra hour, Laura said, nodding toward the jungle gym. He said you're teaching him chess. Jack chuckled. <laughs> He's getting pretty good. He beat me last week. Her laugh was soft but genuine. That's impressive. He's stubborn, like his dad. Jack smiled, the compliment tinged with nostalgia. <laughs> and smart, like his mom. The silence returned, but it wasn't uncomfortable this time. It felt like an understanding, an unspoken truce. Later that evening, Jack walked Peter back to Laura's house. The boy chattered about his day, oblivious to the undercurrents between his parents. When they reached the door, Laura bent down to hug Peter tightly, her hands lingering on his shoulders. Go wash up, sweetheart, she said, her voice warm. As Peter disappeared into the house, Laura turned to Jack. Would you like to come in, just for a coffee? Jack hesitated. There was a time when such an invitation would have felt natural, but now it carried weight. Still, he nodded. Sure. 
They sat in the kitchen, the same kitchen where they had once shared so much of their lives. The room looked different now. Laura had repainted the walls, replaced the curtains. Jack wondered if it was her way of erasing the past or starting fresh. Are you okay? She asked suddenly, her voice gentle but direct. Jack looked up, startled. I'm fine. Laura tilted her head, her eyes searching his. Are you? He sighed, the weight of her question settling over him. I'm trying, he admitted. Some days are better than others. She nodded, her expression softening. Me too. For the first time in a long while, Jack felt the faint stirrings of something he couldn't quite name. Something close to hope. They weren't the people they used to be, and they never would be again. But maybe, just maybe, they could find a way to coexist in this new reality. Months later, Jack found himself sitting across from Natalie in a quiet cafe. She was different from Laura in every way. Bold where Laura had been reserved, spontaneous where Laura had been deliberate, but there was a gentleness to her that reminded Jack of what he had once loved about his ex-wife. Do you think you'll ever stop looking back? Natalie asked, her voice thoughtful. Jack stirred his coffee, his gaze distant. I don't think you ever really stop, he said honestly, but looking back doesn't mean I can't move forward. Natalie smiled, her hand reaching across the table to cover his. That's good enough for me. As for Laura, she found solace in her own way. She started volunteering at a local women's shelter, helping others navigate the kind of pain she had endured. It was hard, but it was healing. Slowly, she began to rebuild, not just her life, but her sense of self. One afternoon, Daniel, the kind widower she'd met months ago, joined her at the park. He brought two cups of coffee and a quiet understanding that Laura found comforting. You think you'll ever trust again? He asked, his tone light but curious. Laura looked at him, the question hanging in the air like a leaf caught in the breeze. I think I'm um, learning to, she said finally, one step at a time. In the end, Jack and Laura's story wasn't about vengeance or reconciliation, it was about survival. They had loved deeply, hurt each other profoundly, and walked away carrying the scars of their shared past. But those scars, painful as they were, also carried lessons about forgiveness, about resilience, and about the possibility of starting over. The autumn leaves fell gently around them, a reminder that even as seasons ended, others would always begin. And with each step forward, Jack and Laura found a way to honor what they had lost while embracing what lay ahead. It wasn't perfect, but it was enough. Each character takes their own path, but all carry lessons from the past. Jack and Laura, though no longer together, hold on to a sense of respect and the memory of a love that was once beautiful. They haven't fully reconciled, nor have they completely forgotten, but they've learned to accept and move forward. Though bittersweet, their story is not just about pain, but also about growth, compassion, and the hope that new chapters can always begin. Thank you for listening to our story. See you in the next one.